Welcome to Discovering the Ancient Paths. I am Pastor Mark Biltz of El Shaddai Ministries. We meet every Saturday morning in Tacoma, Washington from 10 a.m. to 1230. One of the most exciting things we do is to look at the New Testament through the lens of the culture during the very days of the Messiah. We also go through the Torah or the first five books of Moses throughout the entire year, dividing it into 52 sections so over the year, all five books are covered. Remember after the resurrection on the road to Emmaus, how the disciples' hearts were burning as Jesus opened up the Old Testament to them in ways they had never seen. That's what we do every week. Join us on the journey of your life right here at El Shaddai Ministries, meeting every Saturday morning right here in Tacoma, Washington from 10 a.m. to 1230. We'll see you there. Okay, so here we are now, and this is Acre Mote. This begins our Torah portion, and Acre Mote means after the death. Who died? It was Nadab and Abihu, the two sons of Aaron who offered strange fire at the grand opening ceremony. Can you imagine? It's the grand opening ceremony. It's supposed to be great times. Uh, I mean, that was the setting, but you know what's amazing? At the grand opening ceremony on Nisan 1, Moses is finding out about how God wants them to keep Yom Kippur, which isn't for several months later. So they're going through the Yom Kippur ceremony, everything that they'll be doing at the grand opening ceremony. And when you think about it, Yom Kippur is about what? Finding forgiveness. It's about drawing near. Well, guess what? Nadab and Abihu, they drew near and they died because they did not follow the correct protocol. Nadab and Abihu were not listening. When you go to Leviticus 1, if you remember, Exodus 30, Leviticus 1 are connected. Exodus 30, the glory falls, the fire falls, and then Leviticus 1 is really the same day as God immediately talking. There should be no break. God is telling Moses, okay, now, here's how you draw near so you don't die. This is the protocol you have to follow. But Nadab and Abihu were not listening. This is why even though we can be in the presence of God, we need to realize we still need to be listening and we can't just go do our own thing. In Leviticus 16.1, our Torah portion begins, the Lord spoke to Moses after the death of the two sons of Aaron when they drew near before the Lord and died. Wow, here you have Aaron's sons bringing incense, wanting to... To draw near to God, what's wrong with that? Okay, <laughs> you have to follow protocol. In Hebrews 4, look at verse 14 through 16. Having then a great high priest who passed through the heavens, Yeshua, the Son of God, let us hold tightly to our confession, for we don't have a high priest who can't be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but one who has been in all points tempted like we are, yet without sin. And then it says this, let us therefore draw near with boldness to the throne of grace. Well, the Ark of the Covenant was the throne of grace. It was called the mercy seat, that we may receive mercy and find grace for help in the time of need. The Bible says we can draw boldly, but doesn't say to come stupidly. There is a difference. Okay, we cannot treat God's presence as common. It was a throne of grace and mercy even when Nadab and Abihu died. Just because you know electricity, you still have to follow the protocols when handling it. Does that make sense? Okay, my nickname is Sparky because I don't know anything about electricity. <laughs> so I leave that to the electricians. Now think about this for a minute. Here are Torah portion. God is introducing the whole concept of Yom Kippur, the whole concept of drawing near, of forgiveness, how to do it, when to do it. Now, if you were God, how would you introduce Yom Kippur to humanity? I mean, the Garden of Eden's happened, that man is expelled, you leave for the first time in history, you are now coming back in one sense to have a Garden of Eden on earth again. You're going to come and you want to dwell with man and you want to tell them that there's forgiveness and you can commune with God, you know, if, you know, it's a good thing I'm not God. Uh, if, I mean, if I was thinking about it, I would say, okay, here's the, the date, the time, it's going to be a wonderful day, you're forgiven. 
I mean, that's how I would have begun the commentary. Okay, guys, guess what? I'm God. I'm going to forgive you. On Tishri 10, you're going to find forgiveness. But that's not what God does. God sets up all the protocol first before he ever announces the day and the time. Let's look at this. He actually, God begins with the negative. Think about this. If you're going to introduce something as great and fantastic as forgiveness is coming, why do you begin with don't do this unless you're introducing protocol? Look at what he says in verse 2 of Leviticus 16. The Lord says to Moses, speak to Aaron your brother that he come not at all times into the holy place within the veil before the mercy seat which is on the ark that he doesn't die for I will appear in the cloud on the mercy seat so he's saying look tell Aaron his sons came into the holy of holies they died and he needs to know right now from the get go don't do that here's there's all these rules and protocols first but there's no talk about forgiveness until verse 29 and 30 in this chapter I mean, I would be thinking of, hey, I want to forgive you guys, and here's the how-to, rather than follow all these rules so that you can draw near so you don't die. And by the way, you'll also be forgiven. I mean, that's kind of how the thing is presented. Here you have to go into a place that is concealed by a curtain, and only one person can enter, and not at any time, but once a year. Now, isn't Yom Kippur all about forgiveness? So why not just start with that? Why didn't he take verse 29 and 30 and put them at the very beginning of the chapter? It's all topsy-turvy. Maybe it's because forgiveness on Yom Kippur is not the main object. It's the secondary item. So let's take a look and see what the main object of Yom Kippur is. First, let's look at verse 12 through 14. Here it says, he'll, the, the high priest is to take a censer full of burning coals from fire from off the altar. Before the Lord, his hands are going to be full of sweet incense that's beaten small. And it's to be brought within the veil. And then he puts the incense upon the fire before the Lord, that the cloud of incense may cover the mercy seat that is on the testimony, that he died not. And he shall take of the blood of the bull and sprinkle it with his finger on the mercy seat eastward. And before the mercy seat shall he sprinkle of the blood with his finger. How many times? Okay, so let's look at something here. Here we have from off the altar. Uh, this would have been not during Moses' day, obviously, but Solomon's, let's say. Uh, they go, they get, they have in, burning incense from fire off the altar. And he goes in before the mercy seat. And he sprinkles the blood from the bull seven times on the mercy seat. He's all dressed in white because it's Yom Kippur. Now, you know what's amazing? This is the word for mercy seat, kaparot. And I want you to notice this. The tav has a value of 400 numerically in Hebrew. Reish, 200. Pay, 80. Kaf, 20 for a total of 700. The very word mercy seat is 700. And he sprinkles the blood seven times. Okay, the number seven is so incredible. Now, what's amazing about this is when you compare Leviticus, what we just read about, to the book of Revelation, we're going to see a Yom Kippur service going on in heaven. Okay, we're going to see an angel who also goes and grabs incense from the altar. Look at this, Levitic, uh, Revelation chapter 8, verse 1 through 6. When he opened the witch seal, the seventh seal there was silence in heaven for the space of half an hour and i saw seven angels which stood before god to them were given seven trumpets another angel came and stood at the altar having a golden censer that was given to him much incense do you see the parallel between book of revelation and leviticus what we just read that he should offer with the prayers of all the saints the incense remember god told moses pattern the tabernacle after the one you see in heaven so in heaven, the incense represents the prayers of the saints. And on earth, it was the physical incense, the sweet incense. On the golden altar, which was before the throne, and the smoke of the incense, which came with the prayers of the saints, ascended up before God out of the angel's hand. And the angel took the censer and filled it with what? Fire of the altar, just like that happened in Leviticus. He cast it into the earth, and there were voices and thunder and lightning and an earthquake and the seven angels, which had the seven trumpets, prepared themselves to stand at the end of the seventh seal. And the mercy seat in Hebrew is 700. 
fascinating. So here we, it's like the, the prayers of all the saints are ascending up before God. In the tabernacle, the priest was to bring this cloud of incense to meet with God's cloud over the mercy seat. So here God's presence is a pillar of cloud. And he's, this cloud of God is on the mercy seat. And then here comes the cloud, which is the prayers of the saints. And the two clouds are to intermingle. You following me? Okay. When was the last time there was a cloud God inhabited and they could not come close or else they would die? Mount Sinai. Let's go back at Exodus 19, 9 through 13. The Lord says to Moses, I'm going to come to you in a thick cloud that the people may hear when I speak with you and believe you forever. So Moses told the words of the people to the Lord, and the Lord said to Moses, go to the people, sanctify them today and tomorrow, and let them wash their clothes and be ready against the what? The third day. What happens on the third day? The Lord will come down in the sight of all the people. The third day, the Lord will come down in the sight of all the people on Mount Sinai. And it says, I want you to set bounds to the people round about, saying, take heed to yourselves that you don't go up to the mount or touch the border. Whoever touches the mount will be surely put to death. No one to leave, no hand will touch it, but he will surely be stoned or shot through, whether it's an animal or a man. It shall not live. When the trumpet sounds long, then they shall come up close to the mount. So here we have, it's Mount Sinai. And Moses, he's ascending, and he's receiving the commandments. You know, that no one could go near the mount. So here we have the giving of the commandments, a cloud covering the mount, Now think about this. Those same commandments are within the Ark of the Covenant with the cloud covering it in Leviticus. Those commandments that were given to Moses are now in the Ark of the Covenant. There's this cloud there, just like on Mount Sinai. But there's a covering over the mercy seat that they're in. So God's glory cloud was over the Ark, and now man is bringing a cloud of incense so that our man-made cloud of incense may come into contact with God's glory cloud. And God's glory cloud was to totally immerse our cloud. And this is the moment when the greatest danger of death is possible, when man meets God. The imperative is not about forgiveness. It's about meeting your maker. That's what's about to happen. On Yom Kippur, we need to get the concept of, I'm about to meet with our maker. Every year, there's a reminder, we need to meet with our maker. What Yom Kippur is, it's actually a recreation of the Sinai experience at Shavuot or Pentecost in coming in contact with the creator of the universe every year. Forgiveness was but a byproduct of coming in contact with the Almighty. When we draw near to God, forgiveness just comes. So Yom Kippur is not about forgiveness, it's about drawing near to God and how to do it properly. And when we follow the protocol, forgiveness just happens. If you jump in the water, you're going to get wet. Look at Hosea 5, 14 and 15. If remember, God says, on the third day, I will come down in the sight of all the people, right? Now, how many of you know a day with the Lord is as a thousand years and a thousand years as a day? Look at Hosea 5, 14 and 15. God says, I'll be like Ephraim. I'll be to Ephraim like a lion. And like a young lion to the house of Judah, I myself, I'm going to tear in pieces and go away. This is what happened. The Messiah came in 70 AD. Judah, Israel was rent in pieces. The temple was destroyed. They were all scattered. And what did Yeshua do? He tore and then he went away. And look what it says. I will carry off and there will be no one to deliver. And then I will go and return to my place. Yeshua is saying, then I'm going to go return to my place. Until they acknowledge their offense and seek my face and their affliction, they will seek me earnestly. Yom Kippur is known as the day of affliction. That's when they were to afflict themselves. And then look at the next verse in Hosea 6. Israel is going to say, come, let us return to the Lord, for he has torn us to pieces. But guess what? He's going to heal us. He's injured us, but he's going to bind up our wounds. Now look at this. After two days, he will revive us. And what happened after 2,000 years in 1948, God literally revived Israel from the ashes. 
This is incredible. This is a prophecy referring to a thousand years as a day. After two days, he revived the nation of Israel. And then look at this. On the third day, he will raise us up. That's the resurrection of the dead. And we will live before him. That's the millennial reign. This is incredible. In Exodus, on the third day, I will come down in the sight of all the people. And now here, guess what? In Hosea, on the third day, everyone will see me. We will live in his sight. That third day refers to the third millennium, which is what we're in right now. And then look at this. Let us acknowledge the Lord. Let us press on to know the Lord. As surely as the sun rises, the Lord will appear. He'll come to us like the rain, the spring rain, and the, that waters the earth. And that refers to the spring feast and the fall feast, the early rain and the latter rain. And in Exodus 19, 16 through 19, what do we see? On the third day, there was the thunder and the lightning and the thick cloud. And the voice of the trumpet was exceeding loud. And all the people that were in the camp were trembling. And so Moses brings the people out of the camp to meet with God. And they stood at the nether part of the mountain. Mount Sinai was altogether smoking. Because the Lord descended on it in fire, and the smoke ascended like a smoke of a furnace. The whole mount was quaking greatly, and when the voice of the shofar sounded long and waxed louder and louder, Moses spoke, and then God answers him by a voice. Well, guess what? God is saying the glory cloud is coming back. This is exciting. How many of you want to have the glory cloud back? So let's see where else we can find Yom Kippur service in our end time theology and in the book of Revelation. In Mark 13, 24 through 27, it says, In those days, after that tribulation, the sun will be darkened, the moon won't give her light, the stars of heaven will fall, the powers in heaven will be shaken, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and glory. And then he sends his angels to gather all the elect from the uttermost corners of the earth to the uttermost parts of heaven. And then look at Revelation eleven nineteen. All of a sudden, the temple of God is opened in heaven, and there was seen in the, his temple the ark of his testament, and there was what? Lightning and voices and thundering and earthquake and great hell, just like at Shavuot. Because Yom Kippur is to be a shadow of Shavuot. Or Shavuot was a shadow of what's going to happen also on Yom Kippur. And the purpose, it says, Leviticus 16, 30, for on that day, the priest is going to make atonement for you to cleanse you that you may be clean from all your sins before the Lord. It's a Sabbath of rest. You're to afflict your souls by a statute forever. So there's two things going on here, actually, on Yom Kippur. One is covering and one is cleansing. Ye kaper is what the, for atonement uh, is the word there. I have it in Hebrew for you. It actually is an object. In other words, God is saying, I got you covered. Okay? Seven times we actually hear of covering. The cop red is the covering, the mercy seat. God wants to cover you, putting you under the shadow of his wings, the angelic wings, on either side of the mercy seat. So on Yom Kippur, we become enveloped by God himself with his cloud of glory, purifying us, washing us clean. Forgiveness did not just come out of the blue. God does not wave a magic wand and say, you're forgiven. It happens through coming in contact with your maker. Even when we repent and let go of our sins, we are still dirtied by our actions. We need the washing of the word. Yeshua is the word. To get clean, you have to go into the washing machine. A covering as a child in the womb, as pure as a newborn child. So Yom Kippur is first and foremost about drawing close to God and the result of coming in contact and then secondly comes forgiveness and cleansing as a result. This is why they would wear all white on Yom Kippur, because they're clean. This is why in Leviticus 16.4, it says, I want you to put on the linen coat, a linen girdle, linen turban, linen breeches. All these are holy garments. And he's to wash his flesh in water and put it on. This is why in Ephesians 5, 25 through 27, husbands are to love their wives as Messiah loved the assembly, having cleansed it by the washing of water with the word that it should be holy and without blemish. And in Revelation 19, 13, what do we see? Everyone is wearing white because it's a Yom Kippur event. And they're all clothed in linen, white and clean. And so we're going to conclude with Leviticus 16, 7 through 10, where he takes these two goats to make atonement, and he presents them before the Lord. 
And I want you to know the two goats are one offering. So the scapegoat and the lot for the Lord come together as one offering. We're looking uh, this morning in our tour portion, even though it's on the first of Nisan, it's talking about what Israel is supposed to do on the 10th of Tishri, on Yom Kippur. And one of the things that I think is so important is when we realize prophetically that all of the Moedim, all of the feasts will be fulfilled on the day. The spring feasts were fulfilled to the day of his first coming. The fall feasts will be fulfilled to the day of his second coming. And when we begin to read the book of Revelation and the New Testament and the events, with that in mind, we can make the connection between what's happening on earth and what's happening in heaven. Because as I said in the first part, God told Moses, I want you to pattern everything on earth after what's going on in heaven. If there's a tabernacle on earth, guess what? There's one in heaven. This is the heavenly Jerusalem that's going to descend after the end of the millennial reign. That's right. There's a Jerusalem above and a Jerusalem below that's patterned after the one above. And so let's take a look again at our Torah portion at the Yom Kippur service. And then we're going to go to the book of Revelation to see what's going to be happening in the heavenly some year on that very day. That's the thing. The events will happen as we're reading them on the same day. We see in Leviticus 16, 16 and 17 how the high priest is to make an atonement for the holy place because of the uncleanness of the children of Israel, because of their transgressions and all their sins. And so shall he do for the tabernacle of the congregation that remains among them, right in the middle of all their uncleanness. And then look what it says. And there shall be no man in the tabernacle of the congregation when Aaron goes in to make atonement in the holy place until he comes out and has made atonement for himself, for his household, and for all the congregation of Israel. So first off, I want you to realize Yom Kippur was an event specifically for the nation of Israel. It was for Aaron, for his family, and then for all the congregation of Israel, so that five days later on the Feast of Tabernacles, they could make atonement for all the nations of the world. So Yom Kippur is specifically an Israel event. But now let's go to Revelation 15, verse 4 through 8, and see if we can connect the same language that was being used in Leviticus. It says, Who will not fear you, O Lord, and glorify your name? For you only are holy. All the nations are going to come and worship before you, for your judgments are made manifest. That's what happens on Yom Kippur. After that, I looked, and behold, the temple of the tabernacle, the testimony in heaven was open. The seven angels came out of the temple, having the seven plagues. Now, how many times did he have to put the blood on the altar, mercy seat? Seven times, and we're seeing this. Seven plagues, clothed in white linen. That's what happens on Yom Kippur. He's clothed in white linen. Uh, having their breasts girded with golden girdles, one of the four beasts gave to the seven angels seven golden vials full of the wrath of God who lives forever and ever. Look at this. The temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from his power, and no man was able to enter the temple till the seven plagues of the seven angels were fulfilled. See, this is a connecting back to a Yom Kippur event as we see in Leviticus. And look at Revelation 6.10. They're crying out with a loud voice saying, how long, O Lord, holy and true, do you not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? Yom Kippur is the day of judgment. It's the day of vengeance. This is why the Lord, when he began his ministry and he was quoting Isaiah, he stopped right before and the day of vengeance because 2,000 years ago wasn't the day of vengeance. It's going to pick up again with that day of vengeance. Look at Deuteronomy 32, 40 through 44. This is God speaking. And he says, if I lift up my hand to heaven and say, I live forever, if I whet my glittering sword and my hand take hold on judgment, I will render vengeance to my enemies. And I'm going to reward those who hate me. I will make my arrows drunk with blood. My sword will devour flesh. And that with the blood of the slain and of the captives from the beginning of revenges on the enemy. Now look at this. It says, rejoice, O you nations, with his people. That's the Jewish people. 
He will avenge the blood of his servants. See, in Revelation, he was asking when. They were asking, when are you going to avenge our blood? In Deuteronomy 32, we see a time is coming. Well, he will avenge the blood of his servants. He will render vengeance to his adversaries. He will be merciful to his land and his people. He's talking about Israel and the Jewish people here. And so Moses comes and speaks all the words of this song in the ears of the people. He and Hosea, the son of Nun, or Nun. And so here we see this idea, when God raises his hand, he, he's swearing, okay? And if God swears that he's going to do something, how many of you believe it's going to be done? When he raises his hand, oh, look out. Well, look at this. He has this glittering sword in his hand. Now, in Revelation 19, 2, we see this prophecy is going to finally be fulfilled in Deuteronomy 32. It says, true and righteous are his judgments. He's judged the great whore, which corrupted the earth with her fornication, and he has avenged the blood of his servants at her hand. Now, he's got this glittering sword. Look at Hebrews 4.12. The word of God is living and active and sharper than what? Any two-edged sword. And then look at Revelation 19, 15 through 18. Out of his mouth goes what? And his word is likened unto a sharp sword. And so he's going to be speaking and his word will be cutting. That he, with it, his word, he's going to smite the nations. Rule them with the rod of iron. And he treads the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he has on his clothing and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. And that, that's amazing. And then look what he says. He sees an angel standing in the sun and crying with a loud voice, saying to all the fowls that fly in the middle of heaven, come gather yourselves together to the supper of the great God, that you can eat the flesh of kings and the flesh of captains, mighty men, horses, and those that sit on them, the flesh of all men, free and bond, small and great. Wow, there's a big judgment coming upon all the nations of the world. And this judgment will be coming around Yom Kippur. In Genesis, there were 70 nations after the flood the world was divided into. And so on the Feast of Tabernacles, God had Israel kill 70 bulls, one for each nation. So as priests, as a nation of priests, they made atonement for themselves on Yom Kippur. Five days later, on the Feast of Tabernacles, they would make atonement for all the nations of the world, killing one bull for every nation. And then what does the devil do? He convinces the nations to go and destroy the very thing God was using to make atonement for them. Talk about cutting off your nose to spite your face. Now look at Deuteronomy 32.8. It says, When the Most High divided to the nations their inheritance, when he separated the sons of Adam, he set the bounds of the people according to the number of the children of Israel. Well, that's incredible because this happened like 500 years before Abraham, Isaac, or Jacob. And yet he knew there would be 70 children of Israel going into Egypt, as it says in the Torah. He, he, God has this all planned. So now what I want to do is transition to the New Testament, uh, the Brit Hadashah, and let's look at some of those verses. Uh, Luke 14 is that portion. And what does it say? He goes into the house of one of the chief Pharisees to eat bread on the Sabbath day. And what are they doing? They're watching him. They're watching to him, see what he's going to do. And let's go to verse 7 through 11. He, he puts forth a parable. This whole chapter is about different meal scenarios. First, he talks to those who were invited. These are guests who were invited to the house when he noted how they were choosing out all the chief places to sit. And he says to them, when you're invited by anyone to a wedding, don't recline in the chief seat, lest someone who's more honorable than you may be invited. And he who invited you and him shall come and tell you, hey, give place to this guy. And then you begin with shame to take the last place. But when you're invited, go and recline in the lowest place. So that when he who invites you comes and he say to you, friend, come on up higher. Then glory will be to you before those who are reclining with you. Whoever exalts himself will be abased, and whoever humbles himself will be exalted. Everyone's familiar with that. What a concept. Where do you think that came from? Where does that concept come from? It comes from Proverbs. Look at Proverbs 25, 6 and 7. Don't exalt yourself in the presence of the king, and don't stand in the place of the great. 
For it's better that he say to you, come up here, than that you should be put lower in the presence of the prince whom your eyes have seen. Okay, so Yeshua is pulling from his own words that he told the prophets thousands of years earlier. Let's go to Luke 14, 12 through 14. He also said to him who invited him, when you make a dinner or a supper, don't just call your friends or your brothers or your kinsmen or your rich neighbors, lest they also invite you again and recompense may be made to you. But when you make a feast, who are they to call? The poor, the maimed, the lame, the blind, and then you'll be blessed because they can't repay you. You're going to be paid at the resurrection of the just. Now, that's a payday I don't want to miss. And I tell you what, that currency is going to be worth a whole lot more than our dollar. I mean, really. I tell you what, I, that's the payday I am looking for. Luke 14, 16 through 23. So now what does he say? I mean, here he just got done smacking all the guests. Then he smacks the guy who invited everybody to the meeting. And now he's giving another parable. He says to him, a certain man made a great supper and invited many. And then he sent his servant at supper time to say to those who were invited. Remember, all these people before were the ones that were invited. And he said, come for all things are now ready and what happens? Every one of them with one consent begin to make excuses. The first one says, well, I bought a piece of ground. I have to go and see it. I beg you, have me excused. And another says, I bought five yoke of oxen, and I'm going to go test them. I beg you, have me excused. And another said, I've married a wife, therefore I can't come. And coming up, that servant reported these things to his Lord. And the master of the house now is very angry. And he said to his servants, go out quickly into the streets and the lanes of the city and bring in here the poor, the maimed, the lame, the blind. And the, Lord, and the servant said, Lord, it's done as you've commanded, and still there's more room. And the Lord said to his servant, go out into the highways and hedges and compel them to come in so that my house may be filled. This is incredible. Can you imagine? How many of you want to be at the wedding supper of the Lamb? And uh, you've been given an invitation. Who wants to make excuses about why you can't be there? <laughs> Not me. Well, one of the most important things I can think of, if you want to be at the wedding, shouldn't you be at the dress rehearsal? <laughs> to know what part you have in the wedding. Well, believe me, you have a part in the wedding. This is why you want to be at the dress rehearsals that are here on earth at the appointed time. Look at Matthew 22, 1 through 14. Here Yeshua answers, and he speaks again in parables to them. And he said, the kingdom of heaven is like a certain king. This is kind of what he just got done talking about earlier, isn't it? Who made a marriage feast for his son, and he sent out his servants to call those who were invited to the marriage feast, but they wouldn't come. He sent out other servants saying, tell those who are invited, behold, I prepared my dinner, my cattle, my fatlings are killed, everything's ready, come to the marriage feast. But what did they do? They made light of it. They went their way, one to his farm, another to his merchandise, and the rest, they grabbed his servants, treated them shamefully, and killed them. When the king heard that, he's really mad. And he sent his armies, destroyed those murderers, and burned their city. Then he said to his servants, the wedding is ready. Those who were invited weren't worthy. Go, therefore, to the intersections of the highways, as many as you can find, invite them to the marriage feast. And then those servants went out into the highways, gathered together as many as they found, both what? Our job is not to sort the bad and the good. Yeah. Too many places, oh, you're bad, you can't come. Oh, you're good, you can. No, our job is to haul them in and let the God do the cleaning and the sorting. Yeah. That is so important. Too often, too many places decide who's in, who's out. They even try to think they can decide who goes to heaven and who doesn't. That's above my pay grade. The wedding was filled with guests. Now what happens, though? Now the king comes in to see the guests. And he saw there was a man who didn't have on wedding clothing. And he said to him, friend, he did call him friend. How did you get in here without any 
wedding clothing being worn. And the guy was speechless. So the king says to his servants, bind him hand and foot, take him away and throw him into the outer darkness where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. Woo. Guess what? That was not anything new. Yeshua got that from the prophet of Zephaniah when he told Zephaniah to write this story. Look at Zephaniah 1, 7 and 8. Be silent at the presence of the Lord. The Lord, for the day of the Lord is at hand. Now look at this. The Lord prepared a sacrifice. He's consecrated his guests. It will happen in the day of the Lord's sacrifice that I'm going to punish the princes and the king's sons and all those who are clothed with foreign clothing. So here we see the prophet looking at those people that are clothed in strange apparel. That is exactly what happens at the wedding feast. One of the interesting things, if you're a king and you have a kingdom, how many of you know you're going to have the poor and the middle class and the wealthy? But you want to invite everyone to the wedding of your son. It doesn't matter what their economic class is, but you know that the poor people, maybe all they have, they don't have very nice clothing. And you want them to look nice when they come to the palace. And so what they would do, they would give clothing to everybody to wear when they come. But here's someone who wanted to come in his own finery, in his own righteousness. People who want to come saying, you know, look how great I look, look how great I am. And God says, why didn't you come in the clothing that I gave you? God wants us to realize we need to come to this wedding, not in our own righteousness, but in his righteousness. And then this whole Torah portion is about drawing near. And look at Luke 15, 1 through 6. What did they do? They drew near. All the republicans and sinners, or publicans. <laughs> All the publicans and sinners. To hear him. And now the Pharisees and the scribes are murmuring. And they said, this man receives sinners. And he eats with them. So what does Yeshua do? He speaks a parable to them. And he said, uh, which one of you, having a hundred sheep, if he loses one, doesn't leave the ninety and nine in the wilderness and go after the one that's lost until he finds it? And when he finds it, he lays it on his shoulders rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together all of his friends and neighbors and says to them, Rejoice with me, for I found my sheep which was lost. I say to you, likewise, joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repents more than over the 99 just people who never needed repentance. This, I mean, in one sense, God values the sinner when they repent much more than the one who's always righteous. And then it's the Lord who's going to search for his own sheep. Look at Ezekiel 34, 11, and 12. Thus says the Lord God, behold, it's I, even I, I will both search my sheep and seek them out as a shepherd seeks his flock in the day that he's among his sheep that are scattered. So will I seek out my sheep and will deliver them out of all the places where they've been scattered when? In that cloudy and dark day, which is speaking of Jacob's trouble. But now look, let's go back, though, and look at verses 1 through 6. Before this is said, look at what else was said. The word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say to them, Thus says the Lord God to the shepherds, Woe be to the shepherds of Israel that are feeding themselves. Should not the shepherds feed the flocks? You eat the fat, you cl clothe yourself with the wool, you kill them that are fed, but you don't feed the flock. What's happening? The pastors aren't feeding the flock, they're fleecing the flock. And the Lord says, I'm not going to have shepherds like that. He says, that those that are diseased, you haven't strengthened, you haven't healed those that are sick, you haven't bound up that which was broken, you Neither have you brought again that which was driven away. Neither have you sought that which was lost. But with force and with cruelty, you've ru ruled over them. And they were scattered because there what? There was no shepherd. They became meat to all the beasts of the fields. Or in other words, all the nations of the world have attacked Israel. When they were scattered. And then he says, my sheep wandered through all the mountains and upon every high hill. 
Yes, my flock was scattered upon all the face of the earth, and none did search or seek after them. This is a prophecy of the last 2,000 years. This is what this is talking about. Now look at Luke 15, 7 through 10. He says, I'm telling you, likewise, joy will be in heaven over one sinner that repents, more than over 99 just persons which need no repentance. Then he says this, Either that woman having ten pieces of silver, if she loses one piece, does she not light a candle and sweep the house and seek diligently until she find one of those ten pieces of silver? And when she's found it, she calls her friends and her neighbors together, saying, Rejoice with me, for I found the piece which I had lost. Likewise, I say to you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner that repents. Now, we're talking about ten pieces of silver. What does silver speak of in the Bible? Redemption. Okay? And how come it was ten pieces of silver? Ten signifies the perfection of divine order. Ten is the number for the perfection of the divine order. I want you to look at me with this. In Exodus 30, 12 and 13. He says, when you take a census of the children of Israel, according to those who are numbered among them, each man is to give a ransom for his soul to the Lord when you number them, so the, there won't be any plague among them when you number them. They shall give this, everyone who passes over to those who are numbered, what? A half a shekel after the shekel of the sanctuary. And then it says the shekel is 20 geras, half a shekel for an offering to the Lord. Well, if one shekel is 20 gera, how much is a half a shekel? Ten. Ten was the price of redemption of silver, okay? That was the price of redemption. Redemption money was 10 gera, which was half a shekel. Now, here's what's interesting. There is a similar parable found in ancient Jewish literature. Listen to this parable. It says, the search for a lost coin. So, th when the Jews heard this parable, they were also thinking of this parable. When they heard the parable of the woman with the lost coin, they knew this story because it's over 2,000 years old. And here's how it goes. The search for a lost coin is compared to a person who has dedicated their life to looking for the treasures found in the Torah. If a man loses a coin in his house, he lights lamp after lamp, wick after wick until he finds it. Now, does it not stand to reason if for these things which are only of this world a man will light so many lamps till he finds where they are hidden? Then for the words of the Torah, which are the life both of this world and of the next world, ought you not to search for it as if for hidden treasure? This is incredible. So now, get a load of this. We'll close with this verse. This is Proverbs chapter 2, verse 1 through 5. It says, My son, if you will receive my words and store up my commandments, where? Within you, so as to turn your ear to wisdom and apply your heart to understanding. Yes, if you call out for discernment and you lift up your voice for understanding, if you seek her as what? Silver and search for her as for hidden treasures, then you're going to understand the fear of the Lord and find a knowledge of God. That is where these gospels, this is where it's coming from. So, what do we see? If we go back to this last PowerPoint, Oops, turn it on, that would help. Okay. There we go. Let me go back one. God's Torah is a hidden treasure of both light and life. And that's what God wants us to realize. Within the Torah are hidden treasures. This is why the devil wants you to throw it out. How many of you love going to a garage sale and, and you find some hidden treasure there? Maybe a painting that's worth a lot of money that they're throwing away. And you'll go, I'll take that. What's that one TV show they always talk about? Uh, Antique Roadshow? 
and you hear about these people that got these hidden treasures, things that weren't even there, or maybe they bought a painting and, and they're trying to clean it and they realize there's another painting behind that painting that's a, a real painting that is worth a lot of money. The devil doesn't want you to have the Torah because there's so many hidden treasures. He wants you to throw it out. So this is why we need to stand for that hidden treasure. And with that, let's stand and we'll close in prayer. And at the same time, this being first fruits offering, you know, this last week and this week, if anyone uh, live streaming or here locally would like to help defer the costs uh, so we can do this again, uh, we just would, we appreciate it. But we thank everyone so much. Father, Avinu Malkenu, we just thank you so much for what you have done for us, the sacrifice you gave in giving your only begotten son. Yeshua, we thank you so much that you gave your life because you love us so much. Father, we want you to know we appreciate what you've done for us. And Father, we just pray right now for the offerings that come in that they would bless you. We already know you've blessed us so much, but we want to bless you and thank you so much for giving us this opportunity to take your Torah to all the nations of the world. Incredible. Father, we thank you for letting us be a part of bringing your glory back. We thank you in Yeshua's name. Amen. We, Sherry and I, first discovered El Shaddai a number of years ago when we lived in Israel. We were watching the internet one night and discovered this teaching of this pastor and he was right from the get-go this guy was different he was talking about uh, Yeshua which we quickly understood to be Jesus and he was saying all the things that we knew and understood but there seemed to be um, a depth and a richness to what he was saying that we really had not encountered we had just kind of trucked along within the Christian church for all those years and believed uh, emphatically that Jesus Christ was our Lord and Savior. We were going to spend eternity with him. But all of a sudden, when Mark started talking that that first time, there seemed to be something that uh, was a bit different. I've been going to El Shaddai for about five years. I've been a believer for about 29 years now. And I'd have to compare it to the old and the new. For the last 29 years prior to coming to El Shaddai, I was involved in several Christian churches. I felt I knew a lot about the Bible, but I really mostly focused on the New Testament and didn't think a thing of it. Once I realized over the last five years or so that the New Testament and the Old Testament are connected. And what I found out from El Shaddai is that you will find the way the dots are connected between the old and new. And for me, it just blew my mind because I found out this Jesus that I loved and I was somewhat faithful to, I started to have a closer walk with him, understanding him in his language, Hebrew, uh, understanding him in his culture, Israel, and that he's Jewish. And 2,000 years ago, something that was said then, uh, we listen to it now and this phrase doesn't really mean anything to us. After sitting under the teachings for a while, it's just taught me that um, you can't really know a Hebrew God without the Hebrew scriptures. I think the best way I can describe this, this ministry and what it's done for me, and, this, and I use this phrase frequently when people ask me, it has taken my faith. I always had faith in, that Jesus was who he says he was, and he is my Lord and Savior. But he took that whole Christian experience, which was a black and white experience, so to speak, in terms of blandness, and the Hebrew roots, Mark, Pastor Mark and this and this whole integration of Hebrew uh, language and culture into it, it just turned it to a color experience. So from a black and white TV to a color TV, that's, a, that's the best way I can ex explain it to you. I mean, it just never ceases to amaze me. It, uh, it is just absolutely amazing. Um, the depth of the word and what is revealed when you, when you go back and look at it in that fashion. If you study in his context, you'll find out real quick in the Bible what they meant in those days and realize how it applies today. I guess I would compare it also to 
if I had a friend that lives in Mexico and he only spoke Spanish, but I was a good friend of him, I would, to honor him, try to learn some Spanish. So when I call him on the phone, it's not hello, it's, it's hola. And we would build a closer relationship. That's how my walk has changed with Jesus. But now I found out his name is Yeshua. And that's what his mom called him when he grew up. So I think that's more honoring. So it's really changed my life. That's one area that's changed my life. You won't have a mamby-pamby Christian walk, but a much deeper walk with the Lord. Thank you for joining with us. We hope you learned something new today. Please partner with us in fulfilling the scriptures about taking God's Torah to the nations. You can watch this whole program for free, along with all of our other archive programs right from our website link shown below. We hope to see you soon at our location right here in Tacoma, Washington. See you soon.